Our next speaker is Professor Jennifer Marshall Graves. Uh, Jenny is from Adelaide originally, or and uh, did undergraduate and master's degree at Adelaide. Uh, went to UC Berkeley to a PhD in the late 60s, early 70s, and then came back to La Trobe University, where she stayed for almost 30 years with a break uh, at the Smithsonian in the middle. And uh, uh, around 2001, she went to a position at the Australian National University and uh, became emeritus from that position a couple of years ago. Uh, her interests are weird animals, sex, and <laughs> men. Well, roughly speaking, uh, <laughs> no, uh, Jenny is a, 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 a geneticist, a cytogeneticist, a human geneticist, a comparative geneticist, very, very broad brush geneticist. And uh, we'll see in this uh, talk today some of the breadth of her interests and her fascination with these particular topics. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you, Terry, and uh, thank you for including me in this very nice symposium. And first of all, I just want to wish the Hall Institute a um, happy birthday and many happy returns for the next century. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is firstly uh, tell you a bit about the genomes of Australian animals uh, and then what that tells us about sex chromosome evolution. I might have time to tell you what I now think, that sex chromosome turnover actually is very important for speciation and maybe even for mammal speciation, and end up talking about the future of men. <laughs> A subtext through all this is that it really pays to look at non-model animals because you often get quite different results. Well, I first of all want to just remind you about the relationships of vertebrates. Uh, most people, sensible people in this world, work on humans and mice because that's where the money is. Um, we're the weird mammal lab, so we work on elephants. Uh, the reason we work on elephants is they're very distantly related to humans and mice. They last shared a common ancestor about 105 million years ago. So if you compare them, you can go back a look at what the genome looked like 105 million years ago. We've also done a lot of work on marsupial mammals, and then, of course, we're looking back even further, and the egg-laying monotreme mammals, and we're looking back further still. And I thought that was quite enough for one lifetime, but my adventurous students said, no, no, let's look at emus and lizards and snakes and all sorts of weird uh, reptiles. And so now we're looking back 300 million years. And I said, well, no frogs. But in fact, there's some very interesting frogs, and we're now doing some genome work on frogs. And in my next life, I'll work on fish. <laughs> so a long time ago, we were seeing that there's a gap in our knowledge of genomes of vertebrates. And we thought we could fill that gap with marsupials. So I got together with all the experts in the world on uh, marsupial ge genetics, all two of them. And that's Marilyn Renfrey and Des Cooper in the picture there. And then we nobbled Terry Speed to come and join us and Sue Forrest, who's the director of AGRF. And we formed a centre. And we bid for a centre of uh, excellence. Uh, we didn't get much money, so he called us a centre of very goodness in, <laughs> in kangaroo genomics. But that was enough of a platform for, for me when I was asked to write a white paper, a proposal to sequence the genome of the kangaroo. And the reply I got was, well, you've made a very good case for doing a marsupial, but it should be an mar American marsupial. So we did the opossum. And because Terry and I were both um, involved in the annotation and the uh, analysis of the opossum genome, we had 24 Australians on that paper. <laughs> Next year, I was asked to do a white paper on the platypus. And haha, there is no American platypus. <laughs> <laughs> So 
we, we were successful in getting the genome done at the platypus. Um, the kangaroo was left rather lamenting, but we finally got that done a few years ago with a lot of help. Um, these days, of course, we have genome 10K, and the aim of that is to sequence every single vertebrate. It's a very friendly group. No arguments about, well, my snake is better than your snake, um, because we're going to sequence everything, both sexes. Um, and so every week I get a, a request like, oh, please, could you send a wombat by return mail? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our job from the centre was to provide a, a framework for the sequencing. We did some gene order by family studies and there's Cooper's lab. My lab was largely uh, doing the uh, physical mapping. Um, kangaroos have absolutely wonderful chromosomes. They're so lovely they even put them on the postage stamp there. Uh, and what we used to do was to pull out backs from our library uh, that had orthologs of highly conserved genes. So we were able to build a comparative map. Uh, so this is the kangaroo chromosomes drawn in human colours. And you'll see large chunks of yellow there. That's human chromosome one. So I think the surprise was that the genome had not been as fragmented as we all thought. Um, in fact, the mouse genome is much more fragmented than the kangaroo genome. So there's big chunks of the genome that, have, uh, that are still there. In fact, same genes in the same order doing much the same thing. Um, we thought this looked even better on a T-shirt, and that was really the first large-scale genomics done in Australia. Uh, we also use chromosome painting where we get the probe from a whole sorted chromosome and we're able to use that to compare on a macro scale the, the uh, chromosomes of different species and here's two species of wallabies and you can see that there's been just enormous chromosome fusions to uh, make changes in these genomes. We've also used it to compare normal and tumour cells from the, um, the Tasmanian devil and uh, I want to say a little bit about the Tasmanian devil because, to my delight, it featured yesterday. Uh, the Tasmanian devil is a marsupial. It's the largest carnivore left since we managed to kill the last thylacine. Uh, but it's in diabolical trouble uh, with this horrible facial tumour disease. And that seems to be spreading in Tasmania to the extent that there won't be any devils left in the wild in a decade or two. Uh, I first knew about this when Anne-Marie Pierce asked to come to my lab and bring some photographs of chromosomes of these tumours, which was quite remarkable because they're, they're horrible looking chromosomes. Uh, and they came from different tumours and different animals, but they were all the same. And that could only happen if this was essentially a clone of cells, and that's what it is. So one devil with a tumour bites another and inoculates them with these devil cells. And this turned out to be the case. Um, DNA uh, comparisons show that the tumour had one um, genotype and the host had different genotypes. It also allowed us to say something about the founder animal somewhere in about 1994 or 5. It must have been a female because there was no Y chromosome DNA there and there were uh, heterozygosity at X chromosome loci. Uh, then Liz Murchison came to my lab in the next few years and she did a transcriptome and we very easily pulled out um, over-transcribed genes that told us very clearly that the, the first tumour was a Schwann cell tumour. So we know a whole lot more than we, uh, we had expected to just in a few years. Well, with that, I want to talk about sex and sex chromosomes. And I'll start with human sex chromosomes. I'm sure you all know that um, females have two copies of an X chromosome and males have a single X and a single Y chromosome. Can we use the same techniques to look at those sex chromosomes? So the X chromosome is quite a big chromosome, quite normal looking. The Y is a very strange looking chromosome full of heterochromatin. Uh, but at the top of them, uh, the top of these two chromosomes, they don't look the same, but there is a small region of homology with 24 genes in it. We don't care about that bit because it's not sex specific. The rest of the X chromosome has something like 1,669 genes on it, the last count, and there's many, many different functions. But it's not a normal chromosome. When you look at the genome, 
you can see that there are certain sorts of genes that are overrepresented. <coughs> so this is what we thought, that it was a, a, um, a sweet little chromosome, just the same as it always was. This is much more... Uh, <laughs> it was thought that there were an overrepresentation of genes that control other genes, and there's certainly an overrepresentation of genes that are expressed in the brain and which are... Uh, involved in um, X-linked uh, mental retardation. And there's also a big excess of genes that are involved in reproduction, something like five times too many genes. The really odd thing is that some of these genes are the same genes, and I call them brains and balls genes. <laughs> They're expressed in the brain and in the testis, and I think the reason is more to do with um, evolution than it is with function. So I call the X chromosome a smart and sexy chromosome. Well, what about the Y? The Y is quite different because there's only 27 genes on it that, pro that code for proteins. Um, there's many copies of some of these genes, but most of them are inactive. So it's a very, very weird chromosome. It's also weird because practically all these genes have some kind of male uh, advantage or male-specific function in sex and spermatogenesis. So if we look at the models of the Y chromosome, this is the model that we all grew up with, that the Y chromosome might be small, but it was a powerful, macho little thing. Um, but in fact, it's only got 27 genes on it, so it doesn't look like that. The other model was that it grabs genes from other parts of the genome that are handy in males. And in fact, that's a very good description of the Drosophila Y chromosome, but not the human Y. There's only three genes on the human Y that came from other autosomes. So my favourite model is that the Y is a wimp, a very pathetic little chromosome. But there's one gene on the Y that's very important, and that's the gene that makes you male. So there's a gene that we've always known was on the Y chromosome, and its job is to turn on genes in the embryo to make a testis out of the uh, genital ridge. Uh, that's obviously a, quite a complex pathway, but it was a, a great job to clone and discover the testis determining factor. So we're talking here about the 1980s. Um, I like this because it was actually the reason I got in to sex determination in the first place was the identity of TDF seemed to have been solved with the cloning of a gene called ZFY uh, by David Page in, um, in Boston. And uh, David Page called me and said, would you uh, just check out this gene and, and make sure it's on the Y chromosome in, in kangaroos? And it wasn't. It was actually on chromosome three in this little marsupial, on chromosome five in a kangaroo, which is a funny place for a sex gene, and it's clear that that was the wrong gene. And uh, my graduate student, uh, Andrew Sinclair, the one in the red braces, and my other graduate student, Jamie Foster, um, showed that this was not on the Y chromosome. And Andrew then went to Peter Goodfellow's lab in London, and he was the one who cloned the SRY gene, which we know is the right gene. Um, SRY was the beginning of many, many things, and one thing Jamie showed was that it has a friend on the X chromosome from which it clearly evolved. So that was a big surprise because we imagined that that was a male-specific gene and also was the gateway to find another um, SOX gene which was related, uh, which is the, the downstream target of SRY. Well, so much for sex determination. We'll get back to sex chromosomes. It's clear that sex chromosomes are trouble. When you look at it, there's problems on meiosis because they don't pair very well. There's dosage problems because men have only got one of them. Uh, there's sex-linked diseases, which, again, is a problem for men. If they have a mutation, there's no backup copy. And there's a lot of sex reversal syndromes. And you really have to ask, well, why are sex chromosomes so weird? Is it so they work better? Or is it some sort of horrible evolutionary accident? And I'm here to tell you they don't work very well, and indeed, it's a wonderful example of what I call dumb design. <laughs> <laughs> so if we want to understand sex chromosomes, we really have to understand how they evolved. And here is um, my take on their evolution. Uh, it's pretty much agreed that once upon a time, 
um, the sex chromosome pair was an ordinary pair of chromosomes until one day uh, one partner uh, acquired a male determining gene. And that was a kiss of death for that chromosome because <laughs> then other male advantage genes uh, were acquired around that locus. And then to keep that male-specific package together, recombination with the X was suppressed. And that's my little dotted lines there. So you now have a region of the Y which is genetically isolated. And that's bad news for any part of the genome. And what happens is you get lots of, of uh, mutations and deletions and insertions of, of junk. And then you, you expand this region of no recombination till you get to this point, which is pretty much a description of the human sex chromosomes. They just pair a little bit at the top. But this can go on until the X and the Y don't, um, don't cross over at all. And this is pretty much a description of marsupial sex chromosomes. In fact, it can keep on going till there's no Y chromosome left at all. And there are some rodents that have actually lost it. So essentially, the Y chromosome is a degraded copy of the X chromosome. And if that's the case, one might expect genes on the Y chromosome to be degraded copies of genes on the X. And that's pretty much the case. Um, something like 20 out of the 27 copy of genes on the Y have copies on the X from which they clearly diverged. And these are just three that we happen to have discovered, um, including the SOX3 gene, which is the ancestor of SRY, but RBMY, which is um, a spermatogenesis gene, again, we discovered it's got a friend on the X which we think is involved in making a brain because when we knocked it down in the zebrafish, the brain kind of rotted away. So essentially, these are all brains and ball genes, and they've been reshaped once they've been marooned on the X until they have something to do with sex and fertility. So yes, Y genes are essentially degraded X genes. Well, if we look at weird <laughs> animals, and kangaroos really do look like this, uh, kangaroos too have an XX female XY system. Um, but we don't know if it's the same X and Y without doing comparative genetics. So we did lots of comparisons looking at uh, the comparisons of sex chromosomes right across. And what we do is to map orthologs of human X genes in other uh, animals. Starting, and we didn't bother about the bottom of the Y because it's all junk. Uh, so we started with the elephant and essentially there's the same genes in the same order except for the centromere, and it looks like the centromere is actually a neocentromere. We got a shock when we got to uh, marsupials because the bottom part of the human X was on the X in marsupials, but the top part wasn't. That could either mean that there was a fusion early in the life of placental mammals or there was a fission in marsupials. But if we colour everything in, in um, kangaroo colours, what we can see is that... Uh, the, X, the uh, elephant X chromosome is essentially a centric fusion between the old bit of the X and the new bit. The Y chromosome is interesting because it's practically all green, so most of the Y chromosome comes from that added bit. And the reason we know it's an added bit is when we looked at an outgroup that was chicken, we can see the same two blocks of the genome uh, still there, same genes in the same order. So there must have been some kind of a fusion very early in the evolution of placental mammals. Well, what about moving outside of mammals to birds? Birds have sex chromosomes too, but they're completely different. They're the other way around. The male's got two copies of a big gene-rich Z chromosome, and the female's got a single Z and a pathetic little W chromosome. Um, we're a weird bird lab too, so we looked at emus and they were uh, interesting because when we used chromosome painting with the chicken Z chromosome, we found that the emu had exactly the same Z chromosome, but the W chromosome was also very large and practically the same as the Z. So in fact, it looks like the emu is at a very early stage of ZW uh, differentiation and the chicken is at a very late stage. So that was kind of interesting. What's interesting too is that there's no SRY gene in birds. There's another gene called DMRT1 that seems to do the trick. Um, and it does it by dosage. 
So if you have two copies of it, you're male. If you have a single copy, you're female. That's actually a much more common way of doing sex than the way we do it. Uh, it's not the same as the human sex chromosomes because when we did comparative mapping, we found that these genes were, uh, the genes on the chicken uh, Z chromosome are on human chromosomes 9 and 5. And that includes DMRT1, which is on chromosome 9 in humans, and if there's a deletion, you're female. So you need two copies to be male, even in humans. What about platypuses? They kind of fill that gap there. Uh, platypuses are interesting. They, they are mammals, um, even though they lay eggs, and they fit right between uh, chickens and, and other reptiles and mammals. Uh, so we did the same thing here. Again, we uh, mapped human X-linked genes. They all fell on one single chromosome, which was rather nice, but it wasn't a sex chromosome. It's chromosome six. So that was a shock. Clearly, uh, platypus has completely different sex chromosomes. So what we had to do was to isolate sex chromosomes and map them. Easier said than done. Usually, you just have to compare male and female karyotypes and two chromosomes will pop out that they're not paired. In this case, uh, there were 10 <coughs> chromosomes that were no, had no pair. And so you look at that and think, well, that's ridiculous. You can't have 10 sex chromosomes but you can. The platypus has, ten, has five X chromosomes and five Y chromosomes, all different. And at meiosis, they don't just pair up like chromosomes should. They form this long, long chain. So again, we did some gene mapping, helped by the, uh, the sequence, although that was, of course, the sequence of females. And what we found was that there's no homology to the human or the mouse or the marsupial sex chromosomes. But surprisingly, there's homology to the chicken, um, ZW. Uh, they must have evolved by repetitive uh, translocations between uh, an ancient pair of sex chromosomes, which we think is X5, Y5, and four different autosomes. Um, there's no SRY. It seems to be the AMH, anti-malarian hormone, seems to be the sex-determining gene on one of those bits that was translocated. So platypuses are really weird, and you really wonder how poor little platy baby platypus is supposed to find out what sex it's supposed to be. Well, snakes, um, we haven't done much work on snakes at all, but we're always interested because they had uh, sex chromosomes much like birds. Uh, but in fact, they're not like birds at all, because if you do comparative mapping, you find the snake Z is the same as a chicken too, and vice versa. Uh, if you do uh, genome sequencing, which was done in Boris Backtrog's lab, you can see the blue line is male and the red line is females. Um, if you line these genes up on uh, chromosome 6, this is actually in Anolis, you can see that two of these uh, snake families have highly differentiated sex cho Z chromosomes, and the third, there's no difference at all. And so actually in pythons, you can't demonstrate a difference between males and females on this chromosome. So we still have no idea how pythons do sex. Uh, but the other two families, you get extreme differentiation. And I was always interested in snake sex chromosomes because that was the origin of of uh, Susumo Ono's original diagram as to how sex chromosomes uh, evolved, and that was taken from the differences in snakes. Well, if that doesn't blow your mind, the next will, because uh, there's now some beautiful data from a fish species, which also has the same Z and W system as a bird. It's independently evolved, but it's the same chromosome and it's got a DMRT1 gene on it, the W chromosome has a pseudogene that is inactive, and you think, well, that's just like birds, but it's not, because if you heat up the eggs, you get individuals which have the same genotype, but they're male. And what it turns out to be is that the DMRT locus is silenced in females by DNA methylation, and when you heat this up, the methyl groups all disappear. So... You can do sex anyhow. You don't even need a gene mutant. Uh, in fact, you can do sex without chromosomes at all. And uh, there's crocodiles and uh, marine turtles 
that use temperature of the egg incubation to determine maleness or femaleness of the developing embryo, and they don't have sex chromosomes. Down the bottom is the is, um, turtle chromosomes painted with the chicken uh, Z chromosome, and you can see the chromosomes are still there. In fact, they haven't changed at all, but they're not sex determining. So we have all these different ways of determining sex in vertebrates, and I'll just uh, summarise them here. So <coughs> down the bottom we have the, what we now to deduce to be the ancestral karyotype of a, the ancestral vertebrate um, through about four million year, 400 million years ago or so. And I've highlighted here uh, five regions of this conserved genome because they're the five that have taken on sex determination in different lineages. So in the tongue sole, the red bit has become a Z and W chromosome. <coughs> but in snakes, the yellow bit has become sex chromosomes. But in birds, the red bit has independently become sex chromosomes. And in the alligator and crocodiles, um, we don't have sex chromosomes at all. In monotremes, the red bit is still associated, but it doesn't seem to do the job. We've now got an aqua bit that does the job. And in, in marsupial mammals, the blue bit has taken over completely de novo. And then in placental mammals, the green bits got stuck on top of it as well. So you can see that there's been a lot of chromosome turnover within vertebrates. The nice thing about this phylogeny is that we can date when our sex chromosomes uh, evolved, and that is somewhere between 148 and 166 million <coughs> years ago, um, SRY evolved and defined our X and Y chromosomes. So uh, you might think, well, how does that happen? In fact, making new sex genes is really easy. You can either use it, uh, just do it by mutation. For instance, if you mutate DMRT1 allele on one chromosome, you've instantly got a ZW system. You can even make an epi mutation instead. Um, you can do copies, and there's DMRT1 copies that have become sex determining in one fish and in Xenopus. Uh, and you can also simply change expression of, uh, of a gene. You can upregulate it or express it in a different tissue or express it at a different time. And that we have several advantages, uh, several examples from fish. I also like that because that's the way the human SRY evolved. And so we now know that SOX3, although it's not sex determining itself, if you drive its ex expression in the, um, in the gonad, it becomes sex determining. So probably what happened is there was a breakage here, and then there was a fusion with a gonad-specific uh, promoter, and that just simply changed its function into a sex determining gene. So a very, very simple change can completely change uh, sex determination. Um, turnover is especially good if you can do temperature sensitive sex. And I work with a, a group in the University of Canberra that works on this gorgeous dragon lizard. Uh, we chose it because it had genetic sex determination. And the first thing we did was use fancy cytogenetics to demonstrate there really is a ZW system there. And sure enough, if we incubated the eggs over a range of temperature, we got 50% males. But when we pushed up the temperature, surprise, surprise, everybody's a female. And half of them, because we had a molecular marker, we could show that half of them are ZZ and half of them are ZW. So we have sex reverse ZZ females. And we thought, hmm, I wonder if they're fertile. Well, not only are they fertile, they're super females. They lay more eggs and the eggs hatch better. So two Zs are better than one. Uh, so what that allowed uh, Claire Hollerley to do uh, at the UC was to mate ZZ females and ZZ males. Of course, everybody's ZZ. And their sex depends on the temperature. So that was uh, the, uh, the subject of our paper last week in Nature. And uh, essentially, we have changed a GSD system into a TSD system in one generation. This was thought not to be possible at all, but it, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, Claire had a very productive month. She also gave birth to a baby. <laughs> so. Uh, so I've often wondered about sex chromosome change because it's so drastic that it immediately imposes reproductive barriers. But the dogma is that speciation depends on the accumulations of small mutations in populations that are physically or in some other way isolated. And that sex chromosome change is secondary. But I'm really beginning to wonder whether we've been um, taken for a ride here. Why not directly by sex chromosome change? Because if you get a de novo sex-determining system, the way we know has happened, uh, the mating between the old and the new system is not going to work very well because the sex chromosomes are specialised, they're degraded, they're inactive, they're dosage compensated. Uh, and so most of the hybrids are going to be either dead or infertile. And even if you just simply fuse a sex chromosome with an autosome or add a bit on, again, uh, the, uh, you're going to get a lot of inviability in the hybrids. So I think it's, it's very significant if you look at where these changes occurred, we know that SRY evolved right near the divergence of uh, prototheory, that's monotheory, monotremes with the rest of the mammals. If you look at where marsupials diverged, it's right at the point at which the addition occurred. If that's not enough, well, you can look at all the translocations that happened in the monotreme lineage. Again, the first one happened very close to the divergence. And there's the last one actually is different in the two lineages of monotremes. So, I really think you can make a case that sex chromosome turnover is actually driving mammal divergence. Well, that all happened a long time ago, but closer to the present, it's happening all over again in rodents. Um, there's two lineages of ro uh, rodents that have completely lost the Y chromosome, and they started on a completely novel sex-determining system. We have evidence that uh, in one of these, at least the Y chromosome went a little bit crazy, so it looked like there was selection for novel experiments in sex determination. There are lots of other uh, weird rodents running around the world, some um, which have lots of additions and translocations, others that have mutations, so SRY doesn't work very well anymore, or there's something that represses it. So it looks to me as though the rodent Y chromosome is running out of puff, and all these experiments in novel forms of sex determination are being now selected. So here's my diagram again, and what I'm suggesting is there's a whole bunch of changes that are occurring right at the end of this pathway here, not only in mice, but also in bats and shrews, and also in kangaroos. We're getting a lot of additions. So could this happen in humans? And I think, why not? We're mammals. Uh, first of all, when's our Y going to disappear? We can calculate that because we know that 166 million years ago it had 1,669 genes and today there's only 45. So the rate of loss we can calculate. There's only 45 left. And so that means at this rate, the Y will disappear in 4.6 million years. There it goes. <laughs> and so we have to ask, well, will males disappear? Well, if they do, that's really bad news because we will become extinct. We do need sperm. We do need men because there's a lot of genes which are uh, maternally imprinted, which means they're inactive in, uh, if they come from the mother. They're only active if they come from the father. Um, will new sex genes arise and new sex chromosomes evolve just as they have, obviously, in spiny rats and voles? Um, and the last question is, will hominids speciate like voles and spiny rats? have done, because each one of those little clades has got at least three species. Well, would we even know uh, if that had happened? Maybe somewhere in the world there is a mole-vole <laughs> system <laughs> in humans, and the only way you'd notice it is if a, a spiny rat man um, uh, mates with an XX woman. This isn't going to work very well. There'll be a war of the sex genes. Um, so if you come back in 4.6 million years, you might find either no humans or you might find new hominid species.
So I'll leave you with that very scary thought. Uh, <laughs> and my conclusion is simply that the different regions of a very conserved um, uh, genome became sex chromosomes. They specialize and they self-destruct, and this happens over and over again in every sex chromosome system. New systems can evolve and frequently do evolve much more easily than we thought. Um, and again, I want to uh, tout the value of using non molar mammals. And I just want to uh, thank the many, many people, uh, both at ANU and at La Trobe and at uh, uh, University of Canberra and University of Melbourne, my, my, four, uh, my four institutions, and thank the ARC for funding this work over very many years. Thank you. Questions, very brief. Sure. Uh, two questions. Anna seems to have one. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think stand up and well, here we go. Yeah. Briefly. Okay. Um, so, so maybe uh, did I understand you correctly that you propose a possible mechanism could be a chromosome break, juxtaposing. Uh, novel gene which becomes a new sex determining gene with a promoter that is testis or gonad, one gonad specific. You mean for the evolution of the SRY yeah, yeah. gene? Yes, exactly. In fact, there's, there's, some, there's a rather strange paper that came out a few years ago uh, suggesting that the five prime region uh, upstream of SRY is related to a, a totally different gene on the X chromosome. Um, I'm not sure that panned out, but I think it's, it's clear that there's, there's foreign sequences that don't belong next to SOX3 there. But there are more. That, that, that wasn't... Second question. <laughs> That wasn't the question. The question oh. is... <laughs> uh, we're, we're really very behind time. Is there another question? Behind you, Anna. Could you pass the mic on? Briefly, please, then. Um, how, how much temperature change is required in a natural setting for a male-female switch to happen? And, and will there be an impact of even a couple of degrees in climate change on populations? <laughs> Well, absolutely, absolutely yes and yes. In fact, uh, the reason that we got a, f a cover in nature is probably more because we have observed this in the wild. Uh, we've been sampling uh, for 10 years and the number of sex reversed females has gone up from 6% to 26% in that time. It, it's really only a couple of degrees. Of course, at you know 36 degrees, most most of the eggs are hard boiled and they're not going to develop at all, but the ones that do are all female. So this is happening in the wild. And this is a concern because uh, we always thought that, um, that the species that had GSD will be safe. You know, the species with, with uh, TSD are in trouble. We could end up with a world full of male alligators and female turtles, and that's not going to work very well. But in fact, because they switch so frequently, I think they're all in danger. Let's thank Jenny once more. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>